Welcome to the Transformative Principal Podcast. I'm so excited for our first interview with J.M., also known as Sandra Jolovich Motes. She is the principal of D Elementary School in Ogden, which just a couple years ago was the lowest performing elementary school in the entire state. Now, she has made great changes and strides at D, and they are one of the higher performing schools. If you check the show notes, you'll see an article about D Elementary increasing its end-of-year testing scores by 40% in one year. That is amazing. And I'm really excited to talk to her about the things that she is doing at D. This podcast is split up into two different parts. The first part is going to talk about the three things that every transformative principal needs. And the second part, the next episode, is going to talk about how she establishes the culture of success at her school. As always, I'd like to thank our sponsor for this episode, Paperless Principal. Please go to paperlessprincipal.com. Find out how you can improve your life, your efficiency, and get rid of all that clutter in your office. Here's our interview. Sandra Dolovich Motes. You did a right? good job with that, you. yes. But everybody calls you JM yes. because Dolovich Motes is kind of a mouthful. Right? Yes, I when I taught, my students decided and asked, can we just call you Mrs. JM? And that's why. I just kind of stuck. That's great. And so um, how many years did you teach and what grades? I taught two years of math and science at um, an intermediate school in Salt Lake City, Clayton Intermediate. Um, for seventh and eighth graders. And then I took an internship, you know, and took a year off of teaching and then was offered a full time um, assistant principalship, and that was 22 years ago. Wow. Mm-hmm. So it's been a good, long, full time career. To it get has. You to where you are. Yes. Now, right? A lot of wonderful opportunities at the elementary, junior high, and high school level. And so, um, what were the what were the demographics of the school before you came to be in the school district at? All of the schools that I have been at have all been what you would consider inner city. High, uh, low socioeconomic and high percentages of second language learners and high um, eth- ethnicity numbers. Um, West Valley, Magna, uh, that then here in Ogden, and um, the, my only time in which I was with high-end Caucasian is when I taught two years in Sugar House. Everything else has been inner city. Wow. And what, uh, what inspired you to get into the school district that you're in now? Well, you know, my, my mother and father would always tell me the story that when I was a young girl uh, bef- uh, in kindergarten, that when they went to parent-teacher conferences, um, the teacher said, you know, um, Sandra likes to talk and she likes to play school. And so one day I decided that I would just let her teach the class for a moment. And she goes, she actually did it. <laughs> and I was amazed and she just kept going. Mm-hmm. And so my mother always told me that and said, you'd probably make a good teacher someday. Mm-hmm. And initially I was going into science and either wanted to be a scientist or a, a doctor or something in that area. And as I was taking my organic chemistry classes and things, I had an experience to volunteer and work at a school. And that just hooked me. And so then I decided to become a, a teacher. Yeah, I think that hook is what is common among most teachers mm-hmm. is that they have an experience and they say, this is amazing. I want to do this for the rest of my life. Right. So. And it means something. I mean, when you see the little faces and or you see the the light bulb go on in a junior high or high school student, it's like, wow, I just helped that person. I've changed their future, yeah. even just a little bit. And so yeah. it keeps you wanting to give more. Absolutely. That's really amazing. Let's talk a little bit about your um, current position mm-hmm. at D and uh, where D was and 
where B is now and where you see B going in the future. I am now beginning my fourth year as the principal of D Elementary School. D is located in inner city, uh, Ogden, Utah. We are 100% free and free lunch. We have 87% uh, Hispanic students, um, about 2% African American, 2% or less than two percent Asian, and then the and then the rest Caucasian, um, about fifty seven to sixty three it varies percent second language learners, and um, I was the principal of Ogden High School, and um, D Elementary with two other elementaries in our district, our district decided to apply for the school transformational grant. SIG, School Improvement Grant, and the model that they selected was change the principal. And D has been the lowest performing school in the state traditionally for as long as you can remember, and that's just where it's been. Wonderful people. Um, it's varied in size over the years, mm -hmm. and it's a, a, it's, it's a school setting with open classrooms and people that love the kids. A lot of money has been put into it, um, with programs, trainings, materials, people, and it just never rose above the lowest performing school in the state. And so our district decided with the school improvement grant to say, okay, we're gonna really make an attempt, a, a significant change this time. We're gonna change the principles in conjunction with joining the University of Virginia leadership turnaround program. And so I had that training after my first year here. So your first year mm -hmm. here? I didn't have it. Okay. But we, um, I had a lot of uh, experience in uh, inner city schools and turning schools around. I was the principal of Highland Junior High before I was the principal of Ogden High. And in four and a half years, we went from uh, looking at all the 40 categories of AYP being in the 30s and 20s to being in the 80s. And so That's we impressive. made a significant change in four and a half years. And at Ogden High, we made a lot of changes and made AYP one year. And so we were going in the right direction and in increasing graduation. And so I have a track record of being able to move schools. So my first year here at D, I used my experience and training and we and we did make gains. We grew, you know, eight and nine percent. But see, the problem is, is those are small gains. And if everyone in the state is making small gains, you're still the bottom. And so we were fortunate enough to become part of the University of Virginia turnaround. And through that training, um, I applied some key steps. And in our first year of that, which was my second year here at Dayton, mm -hmm. we made. 32% um, gain in language arts. Wow. And an 18% gain in math. And then a 5% gain in science. And so then last year, after that big gain, we um, managed to continue to grow another 9%, 5%, and 5%. Um, and we moved our kids forward. We did not have as big of a growth score as we did two, year, two years ago. We had almost a perfect score. And last year, it was still higher than what had been done before, but it dropped just a little bit. And we were in a new dilemma because I we are very strong at analyzing our data. And I meet frequently with my teachers and, and, and discuss this with them. And when we did our exit interviews after we got our data last year, we identified why our growth wasn't as well as high as it had been is because now we had a lot more kids proficient because we have 78 percent of our kids proficient in language arts now which is amazing it is it's amazing when we started it was in the 30s wow. you know and so when we analyze student by student on their exit interview our we call them our green kids our proficient kids mm -hmm. didn't grow more than a year's growth <laughs> And so we realized that we had to put some things in place over the summer to increase our rigor level. We were very good at moving low, low kids or close kids because that's what D has always had. Yeah. 
and we became very good at that. But now we had the challenge, what do we do to strengthen our curriculum to keep them growing once they're at proficiency? So we've put a lot of things in place this year. So this year, we are confident that we will see big growth numbers again and continue. Well, and that's what we have to shoot for because with SAGE, we still want high proficiency, but we don't know what that will look like. So how we look at it and attack it is we still track and monitor all of our students individually. We adjust our instruction. We do common lessons and we make sure the rigor level is where it needs to be so our kids will be prepared for whatever is given to them on SAGE. Okay. And be SAGE is just the end of the year testing. The brand new SAGE. one for the state. And so traditionally, if you look, according to research, anytime you have a new instrument, people drop. But as my teachers uh, very clearly share with each other and express to everyone in our district, our kids can't afford that. We can't afford to have big gains and then have the air sucked out of it with a drop in proficiency. So we're trying to at least maintain our proficiency levels or increase them with a new, more rigorous test, which is very difficult to do. The odds are not in our favor on that. But we're doing everything we can to try to make that happen. But ultimately, no matter what, we want to have big growth. So let's talk about a couple of things that you mentioned. Um, the first thing is you have a history of turning around schools mm -hmm. and being a transformative teacher. Um, obviously, you've done a lot of hard work to attain those skills. What are the top two or three skills that a principal needs to have to be able to turn schools around and have that kind of positive impact on, mm -hmm. on the students and on the faculty of the school. That's a great question. Um, to me, there's three areas. One, you have got to understand and be able to utilize data and build um, the capacity in your teams and your, uh, your teachers and your staff how to effectively use data to impact student learning. You have to have without data do you feel I mean this is your number one thing so you're saying data is well it's one not, of the most important. yes and it's more than just a feeling it's what research has shown if right. um because there's been a lot of researchers out there um who have been um, looking and examining schools that make big changes and sustain the changes regardless of who the principal is so you've got to put systems in place and so as a leader You've got to be able to build that system and or even enter a system and strengthen it. And the key system is your data and how you use data to drive instruction. You have to have that. And then in order to be able to do that with your teachers as a principal, the second is you have to impact the instruction that's going on by observing and giving that feedback. Yeah. Okay, do you see how it's aligned? Mm -hmm. But you have to be able to do that. So you have got to create a schedule for yourself how where, where you are in the classrooms and that you meet regularly with the teachers one-on-one -on -one to give them that feedback from what you're observing, targeting on focus skills and working on that and giving them feedback on how they're progressing towards that. Then I do that every two weeks with my teachers for 30 minutes. Every teacher gets one meeting 30 minutes every two weeks for me. And then I also go in and observe them multiple times prior to that. So that 30-minute meeting every two weeks is one-on-one -on -one mm -hmm. in your office or in the No, classroom. that one is in their classroom. Okay, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. And we're looking at their focus skill, that uh, what they're doing to strengthen their instruction and get the biggest leverage. And I give them feedback on it. And then we decide if we want to continue with that skill as a focus or if they've uh, mastered that and need to move on to another skill. Um, and my IC also will do those meetings to strengthen them as well, my instructional coach. But I meet with them once every two weeks. Then every quarter, we have what is called a 30-minute data meeting where we have done an interim assessment. They bring the results, and I ask them targeted questions about the students and their instruction and what they're going to do differently off of that interim assessment. And that's a 30 minute meeting and I have that in our PLC room. It's not in my office, it's in the PLC room. And they leave there with an action plan. And 
has been one on one with the teacher. Me. So you mm -hmm. meet with them in PLCs. Now that's okay. That's weekly. So what it is 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 I have a schedule. Every teacher gets observed regularly and they get a one on a face to face one on one with me for 30 minutes every two weeks. Okay? Then every nine weeks, when we do an interim assessment, they get a one on one for 30 minutes. Okay, none of these are in my office. And that's where we do a data review. Then I do two formal evaluations with them in my office. That's the evaluation that I turn into the to the district and to the state. We talk about their goals and and um and how they are for their performance and their rating and their tenure or non tenure. Okay, um, and so during the year I meet with them four times for thirty minutes to talk about data three times throughout the year after their interim assessments, and then the last time before they leave at the end of the year. And that's your exit. Uh -huh, and that's 30 minutes, and it's all about student data instruction. And then every two weeks for 30 minutes. Now, when I do a, an observation, I will quickly meet with them for maybe just a couple minutes that day. Oh, I saw this awesome. Um, question on this, and we'll talk during our session, you know. Um, but because you have to follow up quickly. And before I leave their room, I email them my notes. And then I'll quickly see them that day for a couple minutes, you know, no more than five, unless there was something that really worried me and we don't want to wait till our feedback session, you know. And then I'll make the time right after school that day to talk to them. But so to, to recap, you look at how to drive the, the, you look at the data and helping your teachers understand data, how to use it to adjust instruction. But you as a principal, you've got to be observing that and giving them the feedback and growing your people. That's the second most critical. Right. So that growing your people, talk a little bit more about that. Because I think in education, we, um, we don't focus on that enough. And mm -hmm. we should be focusing on that more because we're either stuck with these people or we have to work really hard to move them out and if they're here we might as well take their skills and grow them in areas right. where they're deficient rather than create a hostile environment or whatever so talk about how you create that well you have to know where all of your your all of your people are at and it's fluid mm -hmm. you if you think that you can say okay here are my tier one teachers, here are my tier twos, here are my tier threes, my tier four, and put them in this, um, this square box and think that they're going to stay there and think, this is how I'm going to dress them. Mm -hmm. You're not seeing the clear picture. It's very fluid. It's just like when you're teaching in a classroom. Your students, based on different skills, are going to vary. They have strengths and they have weaknesses. So if you're in the classrooms enough and you're having, every week, my teachers have an hour and a half PLC in a grade level team. I am a part of every single one of them. So I spend two full days of that in addition. So I'm listening to them as they're planning their common lesson plans, as they're analyzing how their kids did, how, they're, how the priest test went, how they're going to adjust their instruction, how the post test went. I'm celebrating with them. I'm asking them critical questions when... It didn't turn out quite the way they wanted to or if I hear something that alarms me and it if I can try to redirect them so they can avoid less learning taking place and in and increase the learning I do that so that time that I'm with them in the PLC is very valuable so I really I'm knowing where they're at and then I can help direct some of the conversations that will help different folks sometimes in PLCs will even do quick little professional development for a team based on what we saw in the classroom, my IC and I. And so you have to know where your people are at. So like I've got, like say I have one team that I was noticing that the engagement wasn't as high as it could have been. And one of the reasons is some of their activities that they were doing. And so I went on to this website, the teacher channel, I found a couple different quick two-minute videos that directly met their needs, one specifically on how to get um, students to respond to um, different uh, 
passages and getting different opinions and how to interact with each other with writing notes and another one with circle doing reading passages and how to get the students all engaged in this quick activity. And in both incident incidences, the teachers after the, doing the training decided to implement and then it led to even stronger implementation mm -hmm. and more opportunities to respond, which greatly increased their student engagement. And so I saw that in the classroom. I immediately next week during PLCs gave them a quick PD that took more, no more than five minutes out of their hour and a half PD. They immediately implemented it and they're much stronger as a teacher. That's a, what I mean about growing your people. Right. And I have different conversations with different teachers and it's not me telling them. I ask questions. I try to get them to self-aware uh, and, and identify what it is that I want them to get to. And then it's their idea. And I got them there through it through questioning without just telling them what right. to do. Which is incredibly powerful and probably leads to much greater change for them than you saying, you have to do this at this time, this place. Giving them the opportunity to say, I'm going to do this to mm -hmm. make myself better with my trusted principal there helping mm -hmm. me make those decisions and guiding me in the right path. Right. Well, you're trying to coach them. And I make it very clear to my teachers. I go... When we do the feedback sessions, it's in your rooms. When we do the data, it's in the PLC room. Um, the only time you're going to be in my office is when it's an evaluation. And, and I always tell them, I go, well, let's say the elephant in the room. I'm always your evaluator. doesn't matter. When I come in your classroom, I can't separate that. However, I'm going to coach you and be the coach first. And when I need to begin at the different process, I will let you know. And make it very clear that now we're stopped the coaching for a moment and now I have to put on my evaluator hat. We're in this realm now. Even then I want to help coach you through it, but it's an evaluation process and you're close to tier two, you right. know. And so you just have to make it very clear and have that conversation. But and this isn't stuff that I just kind of oh kind of wing it as I go. Paul Bambrick's Santoyo has wrote the book Leverage Leadership. It gives you some great uh, research and examples of what has worked and what hasn't worked so then you can put the systems in place so it's not dependent upon the personality of the administrator it's the processes and you build that leadership and capacity within your folks and there are days that it's going really well and then I'll have um, a teacher that'll start to slip or something in an area and I see it quick enough because the systems are in place you're always around, always uh, and we have on. the observation systems, the feedback sessions and mm -hmm. the systems. And then we also have procedure sy systems. They're all in place so we can see it quicker. And then I intervene or I'll help my, have my IC help. I'll have my counselor help on the procedures, whatever it needs to be, or a team leader help mm -hmm. or have them go and observe other folks with a coach with them. So we can get those um, interventions in place quickly so then they're back on the upswing. Right. So not like a um, another school where maybe the only time the principal gets into the classroom is during the evaluation. During oh, yeah, never. Year. That doesn't happen here. And because you have that, what Kevin Feldman calls the ongoing regard with your teachers, that they know you're constantly mm -hmm. talking and giving feedback, it makes it a lot easier to give that feedback to help them grow but also when it comes time to evaluate them, there's no surprises. They don't right. say, oh, you're all of a sudden coming in my room and now I'm not doing a good job. There's none of that right. here. And you know what you end up finding is that the evaluation conference ends up being the shortest conference out of all the conferences we have all year. Those end up being 15 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes, because it's like, okay, what are your goals? Let's talk about that. Well, we already know what their goals are, but what are you saying down, putting down as your performance growth goals? Mm -hmm. Okay, awesome. Yeah, I see that all the time. Great. Let, yeah. let us just sign off on that. Because all the major conversations have already been taking place. This is just a formality. Right. You know, or unless you have a situation where you need to put someone on tier two for going that direction. Those are very rare. If you're doing all of this all along, that won't happen very often. It, you, the need won't be there because there's so many interventions and right. 
safety nets in place to help people be successful early on that you don't get to that point. And if your systems are in place and you do get to that point, you're not doing your job right as mm -hmm. the principal mm -hmm. to give them that feedback beforehand. Right. So that evaluation should be a simple. And you may have a situation where you have, have someone that is really struggling and and when you get to that point, it's still not a surprise to them. Right. They knew I knew this was coming, mm -hmm. you know. And your goal is is still to turn it around. Um, I um, I had a person, a tenured person, that was recently on tier two, and then uh, taken off. She um, got off of it, and she's doing a fabulous job, you know. And we just had to go through that step, mm -hmm. you know. And then that was just the last step that needed to turn it around. Yeah. Give her a wake up call mm -hmm. or let her mm -hmm. know this is very. But it wasn't a surprise. Right. Not. Yeah. Out of nowhere. No. That's great. So the first one was dad. Second one was interacting and observing feedback and observations. And um, to be honest, the third one as a principal is your student culture. Is making sure that you've got the right procedures in place for your students to be taught procedures, expectations, and turn them into habits and make that part of your school. That is so key. Because if you don't look at instru instruction, and if you don't look at the teaching and giving that support with the teachers and the communication, you won't make it and turn your school around. But you may do it a little while, but it won't be sustainable and you won't get the numbers unless you get the student mm -hmm. culture in place. Procedures and having them turn that into habits. And that's what... Um, we hit extremely hard this year because we saw huge gains. But if you want to continue to make those huge gains, you've got to have that in place because it's kind of like, look at a big tree. You have the lower hanging fruit. You can do a lot of things with data and instruction and get that lower hanging fruit up. But if you're going to get the whole tree to be at the best quality fruit and all just sweet and ready to go and with the fruit everybody wants it's got to be everyone working together and a very safe um, system in place where everyone's uh, making good behavior choices you've got excellent student engagement very low uh, problems with inappropriate behavior mm -hmm. otherwise you won't be able to get everyone where they need to be because it's hard work to get them up to that level. Yes, I mean, absolutely. when you're talking, every child, no matter who walks in your door or when they walk in your door, you will get them up to grade level by the time they leave here in sixth grade. That's a major commitment to make. Absolutely. And in order to get it, you have got to have everyone making great choices and learning what it takes to be a learner, setting goals for yourself. Walking in the hall with your, you know, in a certain manner, mm -hmm. using certain procedures in your classroom, certain procedures in your cafeteria. You have to have calmness everywhere, and it's not just for elementary schools. Right. Junior high and high schools have to have that. If you want to be at that level of learning, you've got to have that culture. Right, and I love the phrase you just used, that calmness everywhere. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot of times people think that we're trying to force kids to to be perfect little soldiers and exactly what we say when we say it. But that culture of calmness is is what really I think changes that dynamic. That you're not trying to force kids to to do things how you want. You're trying to force kids to be in a position to learn in the best way possible right. for them. And it goes past just their behavior. Mm -hmm. It um, in the halls and things. It's their behavior in with academics. It's like, am I going to do my homework? Am I going to come every day? Am I going to be committed in that classroom to uh, participate? Am I going to uh, use the academic uh, vo vo vocabulary? Am I going to in engage and interact and take my learning to that next level? If you want that, you have got to create that culture. Am I going to set goals for myself and I'm going to work hard to get there? Am I going to work hard today when I don't feel like it? When my mom and dad were fighting or there's a whole bunch of stuff going on at home and things are really hard Am I going to make that commitment to myself and my future to give it 100% today? And that's what we're trying to train our kids. They have to. They owe it to themselves. If they want to graduate from Ogden High School, if they want to go on to college, because they all we expect all of them to do that, they've got to prepare themselves now. 
Because if you want to get at grade level or higher, some kids have got to grow two to three grades. That's a lot. And it's not education. easy. And if you're at grade level, to grow more than a year, because that's our goal. We want everyone to grow more than a year's growth. So if I'm already at grade level and I want to grow more than a year, I'm going to have to really work hard. And I'm going to be tired at the end of the day. And I'm going to have to make a great effort, not just an okay effort. And what does that look like? It's a, it's a work ethic. It's a commitment to themselves and to their future. And yeah, a lot of people say, oh, robots. Stuff. No, we're trying to create critical thinkers here. And students that are active learners, responsible for their own learning, engaged in their partnership for their learning. I'm not just expect you as my teacher to do everything just because I'm here. Right. I got to put a, a, an effort into it. And that's what we are committed to. And we spend a lot of time practicing and going over procedures. So it starts with procedures. And then once they start to see that and it becomes habits, then they start to see, oh, I do need to participate. And then when we get, we create, uh, we uh, borrowed actually um, a very rigorous and engaging language arts template for our um, reading basil that a school had created. Mm -hmm. They bought, loaned it to us. And it's very rigorous and it integrates all the different um, genres and everything and it's very challenging it takes a whole week to do it and at first my teachers all wanted to do it because we needed to be more rigor rigorous with our language arts instruction but they were very concerned their kids would have difficulty doing it would need a lot and so we knew they'd need a lot of guided practice and modeling but they had no idea how quickly they would pick it up and how much they don't want to stop doing it when while they have to stop for the day you know the kids don't want to they want to be challenged, and my teachers were very impressed with that. And that's, and they even said, they go, if we had tried to do that last year, where we weren't so committed to our procedures and making them into habits, we wouldn't have gotten the same result. Wow. It goes hand in hand. If you want that rigor level, you've got to put in place procedures and habits and that expectation and that practicing of it. Otherwise, they're just not going to be able to are willing to embrace a very rigorous um, learning activity and yeah. comply to it mm -hmm. and participate. So, so talk a little bit about how you focused on those procedures um, and expectations for students this year in particular. Mm -hmm. For And think about as a, a principal who's mm -hmm. struggling with this at her school and what she can start implementing right away to, to help mm -hmm. start changing. Well, my counselor and I sat down and we went through our procedures that we had at school. And we realized, you know what? They're, we're not getting the outcome out of them that we want. We're not where we need to be. And so during the summer, we went through every single procedure and wrote it like looks like, sounds like. It's the old Naval Academy training of how they train their pilots. And education has used it for a while. We did it looks like, sounds like. Then we brought our team leaders in, and they revised it and tweaked it and made sure we had everything in there. Um, and then my counselor and I provided a training for all my team leads of how to create a looks like, sounds like. We utilized a lot of Annette Brinkman in Utah mm -hmm. and used some of her tapes. And then we brought in my whole team, and we trained them. And then they so you trained the teachers first. Teacher leaders. What? on how to do um, looks like, sounds like charts, and our new procedures. Then we brought in our and you whole... Taught, sorry to interrupt. Oh, sorry. You taught them so that they would know how to teach their students, or you taught them so they would know the expectations? First, their the expectation, and then they're going to help us teach the team leads. I mean, the whole staff. So we first trained our team leaders of how to teach kids this and how to teach teachers this. And they helped us. Te uh, train our entire teaching staff, okay, okay, of what looks like, sounds like, charts look like, and then how they would create them for their room, and how they would teach our procedures that we have for our whole building, and then what they were going to set as the first five uh, habits of their classroom, mm -hmm. and how they were going to teach it, and we had these plans. Then we brought the rest of our support team in and did the same thing, okay? 
then the first two weeks of school, we did not do instruction of any kind of math, yes. language, arts. No. <laughs> we did looks like, sounds like, and we did the Navy way. Mm -hmm. You um, demonstrate the wrong way, you model the right way, you practice the right way. Mm -hmm. After you do the looks like, sounds like. And we did that. Every single procedure in the building kept practicing. Mm -hmm. Then we did it for every single habit in the classroom and procedure. And then they started to integrate curriculum. And then they would stop the curriculum. Anytime they had to go back and practice it. Because our, mo our mantra is never pass or wrong. Address it both professionally and positively. And we're going to go ahead and stop right there because she's starting to get into some real great information on how to establish a great culture and what you need to do to do that. So I can't wait to see you next week for the next episode of Transformative Principle. You can follow me on Twitter at, at Jethro Jones or send me an email at jethrojones at gmail.com. Thank you.